David Richardson from TIA and Craft Institute. Great presentations, great papers. I really enjoyed reading both of them. Uh, they come with somewhat different conclusions, though, don't they? I mean, Julia and, and Karen's paper basically say that old people suffer more, and Richard's paper says that young people suffer more as a result of the financial crisis. So we are, we're kind of led with an apparent paradox, um, or maybe not. Uh, what I would say is, is that there are really two big questions that came out of these two papers. Is One, and I think Richard's paper does a really good job of addressing this, is are there permanent effects to retirement security that we can attribute to the financial crisis? And they take a very long view of this. And then Julia and Karen's paper actually take a different point of view. They say, can households mitigate any potential long-term <coughs> negative effects by changing behavior or reinvesting resources? And you can resolve this paradox by realizing that what really happens here is, is, is they're looking at two different types of shocks. One is the human capital shock, which is what Richard's paper focuses on, and then Karen and Julia focus on financial capital shocks. And so if you look at financial capital, short horizon for old people really matters a lot. If you look for human capital in the way that Richard's and uh, his co-authors model this, it really is the youngest people because it's a very intuitive result. If I have a uh, you know, a steady state for wages, and I have a one-time drop in that steady state over time, the compounded effect of this over time is going to impact the people that are in the market longest over time, right? And the people at the very end of this aren't going to, to uh, get hit that much. So I thought it would be useful to look at that very position right there because it's, it's really made me think a lot. It, as someone that's actually worked a lot of Social Security over the years and done a lot of these calculations and worked with the chief actuaries and stuff like this, it really made me think about how we do these calculations. So I thought it would be useful to look at some factoids. This is a, a frequency chart of year-over-year -year, um, wage growth using the average indexing wage for Social Security. And the first thing that really struck me about this, 2009 is the only year from 52 to 2009 where the average wage index actually fell, right? And we've had some anemic growth over time, but this is the first time in the history that I've been able to pull off Social Security that the average wage index ever fell. So the question is, and they bring this up in the paper, is can wages recover from this big one-time drop? And so you can look at this and you can say, well, average growth over this period you can see is, is roughly around 4.7 percent. And these are all in nominals. I left these in nominals. Um, and what you, if you look at this, is that I think a good example is, is if you were to look at, say, 2001 recession where wages actually didn't fall that much, they fell to between 2, two to 3 percent, wages didn't really recover that much afterwards, right? If you look at the years after that, is, is that you can look at 2004, 2006, 2000, wages only went up about another one percentage point. So I think a big question for, the, for Richard's group is, is to think is, is that, Will wages recover? I think another way to look at this is I, I did a different chart for this. And this is kind of the time series of the same index. And the little red dots are the recessions that are in there. And you can see that there's a lot of variability in the growth rates over time. And you can see how wages kind of fall after recessions and they recover afterwards. Uh, the thing that's curious to me, and I'd ask Richard to comment on, is, is that it seems, based on your analysis, is that the 1970s were really good years um, for Social Security. <laughs> Um, now, the purple line here that I put in here are what I would call their 10-year buckets. their decade-long growth rates, average growth rates. And what you can see, I think it was very interesting for kind of the work that Richard and his group do, is since the 1970s, the average growth rate in every decade is falling, right? And so you start looking at this and you go, what's going on? Because ultimately you want to think that wages are tied to labor productivity. Is this some broader statement about labor productivity? I think you can make that claim. There's evidence to suggest that labor's share of gross income has been falling, right? I think what's more of a likely story, and I think it's important for, the, for your model, Richard, is, is that non-cash compensation is becoming a bigger and bigger chunk, right? And there's an easy example that you can do for the way that Social Security counts up wages is think of an employer that has two classifications of employees. One group all make $25,000 a year, another all make $100,000 a year. And he wants to give a 5% compensation increase to everyone, but you have to net out a $1,000 increase in the health insurance premium. The impact of that 
is that the low paid group will only see a cash increase of about 1%, right? Where the higher paid group will see a cash increase of 4%. So I think you have to look at these things very carefully when you think about it, and I know these guys do, but the, I think there's some strong implications, and I agree with you that I think there's some big implications for the future path of what people should be expecting from Social Security and how they can mitigate that. Um, so moving on to uh, Karen and Julia's paper, I decided what would be really uh, informative is to compare what they're showing with some of the data that we are seeing at TI-CREF. And so um, I'm going to present a few tables from uh, some papers I'm working on right now. And this first one looks at kind of, so for the uninitiated, because we're a chartered insurance company, what we mean by premiums is what everyone else calls contributions, right? So, um, so these are contributions to 403B plans. And what I look at here is, is basically over the period from 2005 to 2010, what types of, and this is looking at kind of broad buckets of participation rates in different equity classes, I mean, different, sorry, different investment classes. And what you can see here is especially from 2007 on, are people are fleeing equity class, right? They're fleeing real estate class, and to a certain extent, they're fleeing every class, and they're putting all their money to balance funds. We see a big uptake in balance funds. Now, for us, this growth is incredibly strong because we only started offering balance funds. Really, we offered a social choice fund a long time ago, which is a type of balance fund. It has a very small, but this is mostly life cycle funds. We only started offering these in 2005. So the growth you see here is tremendous. You can see a big change in this over time. Um, if you look at this, kind of trying to follow along what they do by age cohort, uh, what I do is I compare two different points. I compare the year before the financial, kind of before the financial crisis and, and my latest data, December 2010. Again, you can see I'm looking at 10-year age cohorts here. Very similar to what Julia and Karen are finding. You see a big transition away from equities. Uh, an easy way to interpret this graph in particular is, is that you look at this bottom two bars as kind of the safe part of the portfolio, right? That's our guaranteed income and uh, our fixed income. And what you see again is, is that a huge transition, especially for younger people, it seems like they're just basically saying, I really don't want to have to think about this anymore. We're going fully into life cycle. In fact, if you look at the more micro data, our participants age 35 and under tend to use very heavily 100% in the life cycle funds. They use these as things. I think that's also a, a cause for concern as you move forward because as we all know, life cycle funds were not immune from the financial crisis. These things took a big hit as well. Some of you might be thinking, why didn't people flee to our guaranteed funds? They did, just not in the data that I'm presenting here. This is our uh, primary, our uh, retirement annuities. And the issue when you look at these is, is that the guaranteed fund is, is not cashable. You can't use it as a safe haven and then invest out of it. If you take a broader look at our data and look at supplemental retirement plans where the guaranteed income is fully cashable, you saw huge inflows into our guaranteed funds. And, uh, during the financial crisis. Um, so uh, I put this up just because I find this curious, is, is, is that you would expect all things that are equal is that you shouldn't even see real big distinctions between men and women, but in our data you do. Uh, women tend to take a little bit less risk and tend to rely a lot more on life cycle funds now. So, um, so one thing I would say is, is that neither really addressed is, is more of the and well, Richard's paper kind of addresses this about how do people take their income in retirement, right? And this is becoming a growing issue, especially as the baby boomers are flowing into retirement. And what I would say here is, is that everyone, both papers address the issue of people retiring and delaying retirement for a year. The evidence that we have is, is one is, is we don't really have a very good definition for retirement anymore, what you actually mean by that. And just because you're retired doesn't mean you're drawing retirement income. Right? So you may be retired from your, the job you've had for all your life. You may move on to something else. You may use other resources. You may rely on Social Security by itself for the first few years. You may go through phased retirement. What I would note here is it's kind of consistent with what you guys are showing. If you look at first annuity ages, and this goes from 1980 to now, is, is if you can see what, at least in our population, is, is that people are tending to draw retirement resources at later and later ages. Now, the reason I mention this is because this has a big impact on how you think about modeling what's adequate for lifetime resources, right? 
if you continue with the assumption that people retire at age 65, but people really don't start drawing their retirement resources till around age 70, then you know you're kind of we're kind of missing it on the modeling. Um, one last point I would make, and this came up, with, I really added this because of Richard's paper when he got to the point where they, you do the annuity equivalents, and a couple of things that were a little confused, you said you use actuarially fair values, and I said, well, I really don't know what they mean by that because uh, I know we don't charge actuary fair values because we actually have to charge for the service. <laughs> uh, so I didn't know if you, by that you meant that you're pulling actual annuity pricing factors or if you're just pricing mortality. If you're just pricing mortality, then I think people are, you know, the, the, the price of the annuities are too low. Um, but anyway, the other point I would bring out here, and this is something I've recently started looking at, and this is for everyone that looks at this stuff, is, is that if you look at our data, and we have great annuity data, the thing that's really striking here that I want to point out to people is, is that people tend, we spend a lot of time worrying about people being outliving their resources. Our participants tend to really worry about dying young. <laughs> Right? And you can see this, and so I've thought about this a lot, and, I says, I, and, it, and it's not from natural causes. What I see here, because these are joint survivor annuities, this is really saying that we're going to buy this annuity from TI Craft, and then we're going to be driving down the street and get hit by a semi, and we're both going to die. Right? So people take these guaranteed periods, which again gets folded into the price of the product. And so I think for all of us, and including for you guys when you're modeling this, is to think about how you model the actual distribution process is very, very important and what the preferences that people actually show from this. Um, so my final thoughts, again, these were both great papers. I really enjoyed reading them. Uh, the evidence that they show presents at both working age and retired. Uh, Julia's paper said that they're adjusting our evidence and Julia's evidence is they're adjusting their financial portfolios. Uh, I would say that I think the longer term impacts of human capital shocks remain to be seen. Ultimately, this will depend on the growth of labor productivity. Um, as I said, cash wages may be a poor proxy for measuring this. Uh, I think it's becoming increasingly poor proxy. I think as, in particular, if you're looking at your part of the population with pensions right now, there's an additional pressure that because of the financial crisis, they're having to pay in a lot of supplemental liability, which is further depressing cash wages. Um, but I think there are legitimate reasons for concern, in particular because education seems, seems to be on the chopping block right now, which is a big factor of human capital development, as we all know. And my final thought is, is I think that uh, you know, all of us need to think about uh, models that will help households every day. I'm, I talk to people that say, just please give me some help in this, right? So, so we're all, we all need some help. All right, thanks very much. Yeah.